Okay. At least that's what uh, I think. What, what, do we, what do we want to start with? Well, we, are, we are now live. We are now live. Oh God, I haven't done one of these forever. Yeah. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> My mom. <laughs> <laughs> the last time, the, the last time I said hi, mom on on my live stream, it was it was uh, uh, it was followed by a series of invective that I'm not allowed to. Uh, I was I was admonished to not say in front of ladies today. So yeah, it's funny. I can't Alex, hold to that promise, if, especially if we invoke my mom. So yes, yes, Alex, you look so chuffed that your mom is watching. You look so happy. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> or whatever. All right, well, let, well let's start. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Efrat, for making this work. And thank you, Alex, for making this work. Three times this week. Lucky, lucky me. Three videos with Alex this week. And thank you, Tom, uh, for making this work as well. And uh, I'll have the links to all your stuff in the description below. In fact, they may already be there. And there'll be a little snip of this video on YouTube, on both my YouTube channels, and a little slip on Rumble. But the whole thing will go up later on Odyssey and 3 Speak. So please support me there, bit.ly. Oh, okay, good, good, good. What's the cat's name? Because the cat can also... Cow. Say hello to Cow. Hello, Cow. Hey, I Cow. Cats. I love cats. Okay. All right. But we started Cow has with... the photo bomb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And do all the business about whatever you do that you're supposed to do and I'm supposed to say. Okay. So where shall we start? Where? Who wants to start and with what topic as we travel the macro universe? I was going to say, I don't think there's anything going on, so we can just like bag this thing and go home. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. kind of a bit slow on the news front. So boring. <laughs> um, you know, if we're going to start anywhere, I'm like, I want to get geeky and talk about the Bank of Japan, but I don't think we want to go there today. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> Tom, you'll turn the viewers off. You'll turn off Alex. Oh, I know. Like, <laughs> everybody will just like, oh, never mind, Tom. Come on, stop it. So um, I don't know. Where do you, where, where start, do you guys want okay, to Let's start with the Middle East and with Putin. Because I sure. watched through Twitter yesterday how he was greeted. And then I saw <laughs> what you retweeted about um, the Russian finance minister being part of the delegation. And then the way that Putin travels, flanked by um, four Russian jets, mm -hmm. Air Force jets and stuff. And then what he did in the Middle East. Do you want to? Which one of you wants to start with that? Well, just to, to clarify, it was the head of the Russian Central Bank, Alvira Nabulina, who went with him, and that's actually very interesting that he brought her with him, um, because Nabulina is a very controversial figure, right? Because for years we couldn't figure out who she actually worked for. Right? Uh, did she work for the Russians? Did she work for the IMF? Like she's IMF trained. Like I, I've had, I, I've criticized Nabulina eighteen ways from Sunday, and then I remind myself that Putin is the ultimate um, uh, mafia don. And very good at eventually making people, giving people offers they can not refuse. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she's still head of the Bank of Russia, she is competent. But again, she's also Western IMF trained. And um, I think we can say safely now with her showing up uh, with Putin in uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and uh, clearly going to go over to the UAE, that the infrastructure for some kind of a new financial architecture um, is what's on the agenda. And make sure that everybody knew that Abilina went with him is telling you that that's where we're going. So now the question is, what are they trying to set up? And I have some th I have some thoughts on that. I've talked about it a lot recently, but what I think is going on with oil prices and Saudi Arabia and, and all of that. But you know, I'll throw I'll throw that out there first and let you guys chew on it and then we'll we'll kind of go around the horn. Cool. Efrat, Alex, either of you? Uh I'll just Add that it's interesting to see how the Emirates is stopping. Um, they don't want to accept dollars for oil trade anymore. I mean, that's that's a big indication. And uh, and in, in COP twenty eight, we're seeing the the Emirates Sultan speaks against the move out of coal, oil and gas, which is a I would say like a spit in the face <laughs> for all these guys over there. It's like it's it's exactly the place where he's not supposed to say it and he said like the quiet thing out loud and so um you know going against that green agenda and telling them you know this is how we roll it doesn't work like your way of rolling that green way of rolling we don't roll with that and uh and i think that's another important indication then you see putin traveling within two days to emirates and saudi and iran and jordan everything in two days it's like he's he's doing his he's rounded 
like his his tour, his uh, majestic tour, and I wonder how many oil deals were made <laughs> during these days. I don't know. I mean, you guys are the experts. I'm just like looking at it saying what what's happening here. And then tonight, I think it I think it is tonight. He gave an official statement that um, he supports a two state solutions for Israel and Palestine. And my guess is that we're going to see, I don't know when it's going to happen, but global powers present in Israel to kind of redraw the borders and keep Israel and Palestine each to their own sides and not fight any more kids kind of approach. Like some some global powers coming into the country to redraw the the borders, which is something that has been on the table for tens of years. We we all know the story with uh, the Yom Kippur War and in seventy three exactly fifty years ago, and I love how the the cabal is uh, playing its um, symbolic tricks again, doing it exactly fifty years on the day. Actually, people are saying it's not on the day because we started this war on the seventh of October and the um, and the Yom Kippur War was on the sixth of October. But if you look at New York time or U.S. time where Kissinger is, it's exactly, or was actually, it was exactly 50 years ago. And so we, we, I mean, we can reiterate what happened there just to remind people how in 1973 OPEC placed an oil embargo on the U.S. and, and other nations that had supported Israel against the Arab states in the Yom Kippur War. And five months after the Bilderberg meeting, in Sweden, in 1973, um, Kissinger, which is, for those who don't know, uh, he was an attendee of the Bilderberg uh, meeting, but also the Rockefeller protege. Uh, and at the time, he was Nixon's uh, Secretary of State. He engineered, in a way, uh, the Yom Kippur War. I know many people would hate me saying that, uh, especially Israelis, but um, you know that's what I think. And provoked, in a way, OPEC's response, which was an oil embargo uh, of the U.S. and other nations that had supported Israel at the time. And, uh, yeah. So, so I wonder, because I um, listen And to I'm not an expert on this. I'm, you know, I learned mm -hmm. this history myself. Uh, yes. I wasn't alive when it happened. My, my father had to be a soldier during that war and lost many, many friends. And it's not easy to learn that a lot of your friends got killed because someone orchestrated an oil deal in the Middle East. Yes. And if, I just wonder if history is replaying now with Putin traveling around these nations, say, and, and, and I think it was Alex Christopher and Alexander Mercurius in the video they posted yesterday, and we're recording this on Thursday, 7th of December, where Saudi Arabia is saying to the US, you mess with us and you will be sorry. So hinting at a possible oil embargo and what that would do. Mm -hmm. So who knows? And who knows what else he's he's talking about? Because um, he's not one for wasting his time. Uh, Alex, anything you want to say about Putin and what's going on or, or what Efrat said? Well, I thought it was very, very interesting. Remember, Tom, when uh, December 2021, mm -hmm. uh, when the Russians gave uh, the draft treaties to the United States and NATO, and then you and I had a discussion. Uh, I was, I was, I never dreamed that they would actually go to war with Ukraine. I was, I thought that they would not do that, but they did. Mm -hmm. But the 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 other alternative that we were looking at was that they might speak to kick the United States, the Western alliance, out of the Middle East. Yep. I think that actually both are. I think that this is still happening. And they're still okay. doing it. And I thought that the they are I think that they're playing it in an extraordinarily sophisticated way this time around because what I was fearing that would happen, and I thought that that was I, I still believe that that was the intent between behind seven uh, October uh, to provoke uh, a concerted attack on Israel from Arab powers, from Arab nations. Because in that case, the Western nations, the Western powers, would probably come to the defense of Israel, and probably with some popular support. So you would get World War III. And I think that that's what they wanted. 
but after the initial and then you know also if you if you paid close attention to the you know what did what did Netanyahu do? They went and they 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 attacked Lebanon. They launched uh, several attacks on Syria, uh, accidental attack on Egypt, and on the other side, Hamas were trying to talk up a a general you know clash of civilization thing. They were saying like oh, all Muslims should go out and you know a- attack uh, Western powers, and they were they were trying. I think it was Mohammed Haniye who was trying to uh, induce kind of Muslim leaders around the world to issue a fatwa obliging Muslims to go into like a jihad and to go and spill their blood and blah, 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 all these apocalyptic things. And then it just kind of, um, it kind of dissipated, it kind of petered away, and they didn't. What they did instead is they started attacking the United States. In Syria, in Iraq, in, mm-hmm. in the Red Sea, they started attacking um, Israeli vessels, commercial vessels. So they 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 started these pinprick attacks through proxies, not even you know, not even the Syrians, not even the Iranians, but through proxies. These little pinprick t- attacks, but every day, and in a way that doesn't get the collective West to unite and to say like, okay, this is our cause and we have to defend this. And so I think that now they're completely lost. And I would give also credit to Donald Trump for creating uh, the conditions for this, because if you will remember in, um, I think it was 2019 or 2018, he wanted to withdraw uh, U.S. troops from Syria. Yep. And he got sabotaged by the by the deep state. And then he said, all right, we're leaving the troops in Syria, but we're doing it for the oil. We're doing it for the oil. We're not, you know, there's nothing to do with terrorism, nothing to do with freedom and democracy. We're there to take the oil. So that seemed, uh, you know, that seemed undiplomatic, unstatesmanlike, un, 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 in okay. bad taste. And everybody, you know, piled more hatred on Donald Trump. But what he did actually is he broke the west the you know western european nations support for us mission in syria yes. so today i think rather than west supporting the united states in syria because they are fighting terrorism uh they're on their own because they're there, they're there for the oil and that was very clear and, you know it wasn't a small thing because there were these uh, you know the cia for many years and you know uh Brookings Institutions and the Atlantic Council, they had these um, brainstorming sessions about how to consolidate Western European support for the, what the United States was doing in Syria. So, you know, blowing that, blowing the foundations from under that was actually a very, very interesting move. And a lot of the crazy shit that Donald Trump did actually you know, in retrospect, he cons- he was consistently rolling back American imperial commitments around the world yeah. where he could. Where he could. At, at, also, the, also, at the edges, yeah. certainly. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, remember, he also wanted to withdraw troops from Germany, yes. which, again, also that couldn't happen either. But um, no, I they think had that, a war planned in Ukraine and they didn't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that it created a situation that now has put the Western cabal on their back foot. You know, I don't think they have a, I don't think they have an idea of what to do. And the initiative is clearly with uh, Russia and China. And this is what, why we see this huge delegation of Russia going to the UAE, going to Saudi Arabia, going to Iran, and they're cutting deals and they're probably talking energy, they're talking uh, nuclear power plants, they're talking defense pacts, they're talking security architecture. And I think that the United States and NATO are on the slippery slope out of that region. And I think that the consequences are going to be absolutely tectonic. Well, the interesting part about this, Alex, is remember that I've been saying for a while now that there's a fundamental split between what Europe wants and what the Anglo sphere, for lack of a better term, wants. Like the British, American, neoconservatives want X. And it's very clear that the 
the Europeans, the for lack of Davos, for lack of a better term, want something different. The French and German deep state want a third thing, right? Because they want they want to replace NATO as the security guarantors and the military industrial complex in in Europe. That's what they want. Like that's that's been very clear. Macron's made this clear. The Germans have made this clear. So you've got at least three different factions now making a quote unquote the West as to what's going on in the Middle East. And you know, as I map all of the issues that Netanyahu has had. And literally within Israeli politics, and if I, you can speak maybe more uh, clearly about this, um, that I map at least two different factions vying for control of the Israeli government. It's like constantly while you're like shifting back and forth between, you know, um, likelihood and the not likelihood, for lack of a better term. And this is constantly going shifting back and forth because ultimately um, Israel is a British project, right? It's a British American project. It's not a German project. It's not a French project, right? So it's always been a, a problem here. And so Syria is a lost cause for all of them. They originally were going to, you know, the whole goal of, of blowing apart Syria was that everybody was going to get their gifts, right? Turkey was going to get Idlib and the northern thir- and and the northern thirty kilometers. You know, the Germans and and, and the French were going to get access to Iranian and Saudi Arabia, you know, Iranian and Saudi Arabian oil. That's what the JCPOA was about. Netanyahu hated it. The Anglosphere hated it because they wanted to sell. American oil into into Europe, yada, 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 right? So you have all these competing things and everybody was supposed to get their gifts. And none of them got anything because Putin moved in, you know, brought in a bunch of SU-24s and started, you know, supporting the Syrian army to bomb them and take territory back. And that eventually wound up in the Balkanized state that we have today, where we have the Turks are still in charge of Idlib and, uh, you know, the, the Kurds and American proxies, the SDF are in charge of everything east of the Euphrates River. And then you still have the, the border patrol at al Tanf to... Um, uh, out in the desert to be able to, with the Al-Bukhamai border crossing between uh, Iraq and Syria. So nominally stop Iranian um, uh, support coming in to Hezbollah and to Syria across that, that, that border crossing. That's the way the, the map plays out strategically. So now the, the big question now is, they're all fighting amongst themselves because they still want their gibbs. Like, and they realize there's a failed project that there's always the possibility of how can we get the United States out of here so that then we can then not commit ritualistic suicide continuing this process. Because in the process of splitting these factions apart, which is what Putin did when he moved into Syria in 2015, and then engaged in very deft diplomacy with all of the other major players, he created OPEC+. Plus. Now we have BROPEC+. Plus. Okay? He, the, 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 the Russians and the Saudis own, run OPEC. Right? So we now the entire OPEC speaks with a singular voice when 45 years ago it was being blown apart. So you now have Putin has deftly brought everybody on board to say, look, I punched the, the evil empire in the face in Syria and I'm still standing. They punched back in Ukraine and I'm stronger now than I ever was before. Now I get to walk in. And we get to start setting terms of how we are going to go forward as a block. When he did this in Syria in 2015, when he walked into the UN two days before that and demonstrably said to the world, do you realize what you have done? Yep. <laughs> that speech yep. yeah. laid the law down. And then him and Khamenei both laid the law down at the UN summit. And then Putin moves in two days later. And then everything after that has just been a, a thing that's been running since then. The key to all of this has been the way Putin handled the ex- the extrication of Russia from the Western financial system. Without him extricating Russia completely from the dollar, none of this happens. And this then goes back to the oil um, collapse of 2014-2015, the deal that was made by China and Russia to to make sure that dollars moved into Russia during the ruble crisis to re-denominate all of Gazprom and Rosneft's debt and all that stuff. And I've talked about this a thousand times for those of you who've heard me give this speech before. I haven't done it to Efrat, so I don't so I don't know if you understand my perspective on this, but it's important because as you talk about the historical parallels of the Yom Kippur I'd War, love you to I've got the it. historical parallel today of what's going to happen with Saudi Arabia. Because China came in with their dollars and saved the Russian economy and said, we'll loan you the dollars, you pay us back and you want. 
Okay? I have it on good authority. This is exactly what happened. My friend Vince Vaughn, she has a guy over in China that is literally he's been talking with. So, yeah, this is what they did. And they're doing the exact same thing all across Southeast Asia today. Indonesia, you need, you've, got, you've got companies that are in trouble with the strong dollar. Fine. We'll loan you the dollars you need. Get out from underneath that debt. Redenominate it in local currency. Pay us back in yuan. We do plenty of trade. You should be able to do this. It's a soft way to internationalize you the yuan. The SWIFT data is very clear. The yuan is starting to rise rapidly in mm -hmm. finally breaking out of that 2 to 3% range of settling global trade. It's now at 5.3 as of the last SWIFT RMB tracker, probably be 6 or 7% by the end of Q1 of next year. So it's happening. Well, the same thing is happening with Saudi Arabia. What happened two weeks ago? Saudis and the Chinese signed a $7 billion currency swap deal, which was the precursor of them coming in to help the Russians. They say they did the same thing during the height of the ruble crisis to help the Russians get through their, re their rollover problems that they were going to be dealing with at the end of December of 2014 and into Q1 of 2015. They had hundreds of billions of dollars that had to be, had to be re, that had, uh, debt that had to be paid off because it couldn't be rolled over because the Russians were cut out of the, the Western banking system. That's what's getting set up for the Saudi Arabians today. That's why it was so important that Nabi Alina was there. Mm -hmm. Because with Nabi Alina showing up, it's literally the Russians saying, look, this is how we did it. This is how we're going to support you when they go after the price of oil. And God, God fucking bid, you can see it. And they're bombing the price of fucking oil every day. Okay. Why is oil trading at seventy five dollars a barrel? Hold so hold on a second. It's crazy. It's so, it's so obvious that that's what they're doing. They're setting up another run on the price of oil into twenty twenty four to try and break the Saudis. The Saudis are going to break the peg. It's going to go. We're gonna, I mean, I, ugh, I have another half an hour, but I'll stop here. Yes, 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 Efra. Alex, anything you want? You put a lot in there. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Efra. Efra, anything you want to say? I just want to listen to Tom continuing. <laughs> he's, he's good, isn't he? You should get I'm learning. Him. Come on, I'm learning. No, there's so, there's, there's, this is such a deep... I, mean, I, I was really glad you brought up the Yom Kippur thing um, because the, the, the historical parallel here is the setup. And, uh, and it's all about currencies. It's all uh -huh. about setting up the infrastructure necessary to break the reliance of the Saudi real, which is pegged to the dollar, and the UAE dirham, which is also pegged to the dollar. That has to be broken. You know mm -hmm. that full well that if that get those if those two things occur, that there's yeah. going to be consequences. Yeah. Because we have one mechanism by which to make people pay. And you reckon that's the that's the that's the domino brick, the first domino brick that mm -hmm. we're pushing in order to start a bigger financial well I, 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 the, the, the thing is, is the, the, the interesting part about this is that is, is the following if you bomb the price of oil you you blow a massive hole in the in the in the saudi budget because the saudi budget is paid in reals which is effectively paid in dollars the saudis pulled oil out of the ground at what nine bucks a barrel actual cost but their budgetary costs are 80 dollars a barrel this is the part that everybody forgets about so you break the you break the peg to the real, you bomb the price of oil, all of a sudden, the Saudis don't need $80 a barrel. Saudis can get away with, the, you bomb it to $50 a barrel and you let the real, you let the real depreciate. This is how the Russians did it. But the Russians were holding, in 2014, they were trying to hold the, the ruble, excuse me, below 30 to the dollar. And they were spending their foreign exchange reserves doing this. The Saudis, the Saudi royal family does not like spending the money that they've that they've earned over the years. They don't like just handing it away. They they they're they're allergic to this, mm -hmm. and um, they're they're very clear about this. And during the the last oil crisis, they tried we we tried the, the the same thing. Hey, by the way, this is what you do: you let us bomb the price of oil, you pump more and take market share from the Russians, and then you'll own the market share after the 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 the, the market comes back. Didn't work because Putin devalued. Putin let the ruble float, and he kept his market share. As a matter of fact, he expanded his market share because he was able to undercut the Saudis. Mm -hmm. They were hemorrhaging 25 30% of GDP as a budget deficit for like two years. The Russians, meanwhile, were running a, were running a current account surplus, a trade surplus, and a budget surplus, and making money hand over fist, and the Gazprom was paying out in depreciated rubles for guys pulling oil out of the ground at $8 a barrel. Jesus. It was it was the simplest thing in the world. Like, like just, let the, just let the ruble float. The only thing thing is you have to go through a, a nasty inflationary uh, recession for about two years where the, internally the Russians were running, you know, 12, 14, 15% inflation, but you know, they were going to go through it at some point. So some, at some point you take the punch in the mouth and then you get on with life, but then you're free. 
Yep. And, and that's what that's what I think is that's I think what's happening now is that that the together they can all turn around and go to the to the to the rest of the West and go, if you bomb the price of oil, well, and you can see why the, the Biden administration will bomb the price of oil. It's got three good reasons. One, it's an election year. They need they need gas prices down. Two, they need inflation down so they can get Jerome Powell to cut interest rates. And third, um, they need to, you know, keep playing this game of punishing, of punishing Bropec for having, for getting out from underneath the old system. Yeah, those three things together tell you that they're going to stay a massive attack on the price of oil. Tom, thank you. That was the mic. Thank you. Alex, you guys got it. Uh, nothing to add except, you know, we, we earlier we were talking about hmm, who does Nebulina work for? Um, damn, that just, that just brought back the visual of, of Austin Powers. <laughs> Wow. Who does number two work for? Remember that? Uh, uh, it just it just came all by itself. Sorry, I had to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, I have to say your your contributions have been remarkably profound. You know, your mother and now Austin <laughs> Powers. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. Hey, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but you know, I, I, I do remember 2014 when they when they staged the attack on the price of oil. Oil price fell from uh, it was what 110 dollars a barrel, and over the next 18 months, it declined by like 75 percent or more. Uh, it went to below 30 dollars a barrel, which was which was absolutely shocking. It's been trading above 100 for uh, uh, three or four years before that. Uh, but yeah, so what what started happening is that ruble was starting to uh, fall off a cliff. And Nabulina started selling off the reserves to support the ruble. And that was a very interesting moment because, you know, when 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 a central bank defends the quote unquote defends the uh the exchange uh rate of the domestic currency, what they're actually doing is they're selling off the silverware, the nation's silverware, at fire sell prices, you know. And this defending the defending the currency is the is the uh, the justification, which is which is completely phony. And I thought that was a complete disaster. And then Putin steps in and says, "Stop it! Let the ruble collapse," which is the which is the normalest thing in the world because your your domestic budget is in ruble. If ruble crashes, well, you're still selling the oil in, in dollars, right? So you're getting a lot more dollars for the same for the same low price, right? I, I mean, I mean, yeah, you're getting a lot more rubles for the same for the same dollar price. So your, you know, the impact on your on your on your budget is minimal, or it's 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 very very uh, muted. And so that was, I think, that this is the moment when Putin stepped in and said, I'm the boss here. I'm the sheriff in this town. This is what you do. Because I think that she was getting her orders from the IMF or, or wherever the hell, you know, City of London, I don't know where. Mm -hmm. And she was going along with that. And this is where it changed. Yeah. It continued, actually, Alex, for another, um, for another six or eight months because she immediately... Tom, we lost Tom. We lost him. We lost him. Okay. I, think... I will ask a question in the meanwhile, Alex. You sure. tell me if if this is related. Um, and and the oh, economy oh. was starting to come back. He's back. Right. <laughs> Wait, and the economy Tom, was starting. Tom, to... you were you you back. we lost you. So we need you to repeat what you were saying. Mm -hmm. You need oh, to yeah, remind sorry. about thirty seconds. Yeah. Okay. So what happened? Yeah, uh, Starlink. Sorry, I got passed from satellite to satellite. Um, well. Once the funding crisis was over, once the rollover crisis for the corporate bond problem for Russia was over, right around Q, you know, by by 2016, after a, a, a they she was still had interest rates way too high. Now she was choking off the economy on purpose. Again, getting her orders from the IMF, and I was screaming about it on my blog and my newsletter. I was like, "Oh my God, what is she doing?" And then Putin comes in on a Thursday afternoon. Wednesday, she was supposed to cut interest rates. She didn't do so. Putin goes to the Bank of Russia on Thursday, and on Friday, she cuts by 50 basis points. Mm. Like, you work for me now, or you don't work, or or you go to the gulag. Because well, And what happened, and you know that she was holding it too high, interest rates too high, because the minute she did so, the ruble strengthened. 
the the demand for rubles was so high, and she had and she had restricted the supply of them so much that when she let some of them into the market, the market was like, yes, more rubles. And so, like, literally, it was this way. When you see a central bank cut interest rates and the and the and the and the and the, and the currency appreciates, that's a telltale sign that they were way too high, right? Way too high. Okay, now I want to bring it back to now. And well, I want I want to ask a question, a quick one sure. to Alex because he was referring to selling um, reserves. Is it the same? Like we just had in Israel uh, last month, or I think it was uh, when was it October, um, end of October, for the first time since the year two thousand, the Israeli central bank sold the dollar reserve, um, and it announced a plan to sell up to thirty billion dollars um because the dollar was going so high up to 4.08 shekels per dollar and they managed to bring it down a bit now i'm not a financial expert but just you were talking about selling the reserve so it reminded me because uh, israel has a lot of dollars and uh and the shekel was getting weaker um against the dollar um you know i I don't know why they would be doing this, but every time a central bank does this, I, I suspect foul play. Um, you know, maybe they had a justification of some sort. I don't know, you know, what is... They said it's in light of the war, of course. Oh, they yes, have... you know, war uh, justifies absolutely everything. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously they lie about these things. They're not going to tell you the truth. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't just flat out plunder you know not not by israeli government but but by whoever is on the other side of that transaction you know they they use these crises to do all kinds of all kinds of things that are always harmful to the people but beneficial to the high cabal yeah and then they say like oh it's the war you know oh the oil price collapsed oh you know the currency is depreciating Oh, 1992, uh, Bank of England. You know they 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 bankrupted the Bank of England in this way, and who was it? It was George Soros and uh, Druckenmiller and all of these people. And it wasn't only them. You know they 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 confessed it. They they fessed up to it. But it was um, the the whole episode just. I could the whole episode of how because we know blow by blow how it went with the Bank of England, mm. the absurdity of it that anybody who is qualified to um, to run a kindergarten would even come up with the idea of like, hey, let's um, let's defend let's let's sell off all of our reserves to defend the the exchange rate of the british pound is so absurd that you can't help thinking like why on earth were they doing this to begin with it just you know the rationale doesn't add up but somebody made billions billions while they bankrupted the bank of england they plunged the british economy into a into a recession millions of people lost their jobs Hundreds of thousands of businesses shut down. It was a complete effing train wreck, predictably. And you ask yourself, who is running these central banks? And how could they be so staggeringly dumb? They're not dumb. They're just doing something else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. This is just okay. to complete the picture. This is thirty billion dollars out of. Two hundred billion dollars that Israel has in U.S. dollar reserves. Wow! Yeah, and but, and they yeah. didn't say was... for how long, like what will be the period that they will be selling it. They just said that that's the plan now. Well, what's interesting is that what Alex is describing was the uh, the fall of Margaret Thatcher, and that ushered in the government that brought in the one that moved them into the European Union. Mm. That was the goal mm. of the exercise, mm. and George Soros is a an MI6 asset and he, that he was made by these people and created to, to do exactly what he did. 
Mm-hmm. And then he has billions by which to then, you know, run a war chest to bring the rest of Europe into the European Union by undermining their governments through NGOs and this and that and everything else. So this That's is this this is their game. Yeah. And this is why they, these people aren't stupid. They're just mm-hmm. vandals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when they're and exactly. you know, when you stop exactly. thinking they're about people who run any of this stuff as 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 anything other than traitors to their race, their people, their their country, their any they they have no allegiances. Other than, to, other than to power, other than power and or their religion, which maybe is globalism. If they even have a religion, the closest thing they have is globalism. That and the cultural you know, universal serfdom for us and unassailable sure. power for them. Yeah. Now, hold that's, on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Sorry, I, mean, Sorry, I have to push back. I have to push back. That's grossly unfair. Do you forget LGBTQ? <laughs> <laughs> plus, plus. I got plus. myself abuse. I have, to, I have to flagellate myself for that one. Oh my god! <laughs> That's right. And European values. Thank you, Alex. Okay, <laughs> but European values. Be, you know, we can be critical, but we should be fair. I want to. Be, I want to bring you back to Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, Putin, the oil price crashing, the deep peg of the of the Saudi Riyadh from the U.S. How and when is that likely to play out? And what's the impact going to be on the other OPEC nations, on Israel, on the European Union, on the United States? Who'd like to take that? Sounds like sounds like Tom. It does, <laughs> but I, I was hoping to I was hoping to let the microphone go in for somebody some, for somebody else for a little while. Yeah, um, go, 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 go. I'm a no, social fine. Fine. Should I have a go? What I'll, what I'll say is this. <laughs> I can ar- I can make an argument as to what Putin was really offering in this charm tour, mm-hmm. which is how do we use this against them if they're going to run this playbook that they've run a thousand times? How do we use it against them? Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be this first half of this year, okay? And the reason I think it has to be the first half of this year is because we've just gone through this massive, um, um. Mass for uh, mass formation psychosis about the fact that the Fed is going to pivot and happy days are here again and and we're going to have to cut interest rates and blah 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 blah. None of that is true, of course, but this is all just a big blackmail operation to get Powell to speak dovishly next week. If Powell comes out and says the exact same thing that he said for the last two meetings and the last four speeches he's given, and he closes the fucking door on this idea that he's going to you know start cutting or even pivoting any or even you know, holding interest rates, you know. You know, cutting right in Q1 of next year. They're all hoping for this, and they need it to happen. There are many people out there need this, like they need oxygen. Mm-hmm. Um, this entire run is going to happen within the next three months, and the reason for this is, is that they can keep inflation under control in the U.S. as long as gasoline prices are low. This is a um, the work that I've that I've figured out at this point is that in the current regime of the way our economies are operating in the post-COVID world, and again, this correlation may break down at some point, but as of right now, the United States CPI is a uh, is a function almost completely of gasoline prices. So if you take a four-month rolling average of the CPI increases and you plot that against the wholesale price of gasoline, you get two curves that like overlay mm-hmm. on each other perfectly. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so inflation is down, but that gives Powell all the and and and, and gasoline prices down. That gives Powell all the arguments and all the ammunition to keep rates where they are. Hey, we're at full employment. Gas is cheap. People are going to work. They're still spending money on basic necessities, but the credit impulse is down. And the people who are screaming about all this, who need lower interest rates, are the ones whose assets are getting gored. Right. So enter. For political reasons, they need to drop the price of oil to keep inflation low. But then eventually, supply and demand mismatches are going to are, are going to exert themselves in Q1 or Q, as late as Q2 of next year. This is why Putin is like, no, 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 guys. We stay together. We cut production. We cut production. We cut production. We cut production. We, if you cut production and float your currencies, you can weather whatever storm they throw at us. And then we're going to get the opposite trade six, eight months from now, when the entire world wakes up and realizes that we're in a 5 million barrel per day deficit in oil, and oil goes from where they pushed it down to $40, $50 a barrel to $165, $180, That is the judo move. Let them bomb the price of oil. Let them think they're in control. And then 
throw them. Judah, let them, that's the direction. They want, they, they're going, let them go that way and throw them on the ground. Aikido, Judo, Hapkido, I don't care. Pick a, pick a, pick a relatively soft martial art and you'll understand, you'll understand the metaphor. Like, there's no better way of beating somebody at their game than by letting them think they're winning. This is how the Russians beat them, beat us in Ukraine. Yep. They they kept, they just slow rolled over and over again. Oh yeah, we're incompetent. Let the neocons think the Russians don't know how to fight a war mm. in Eastern Ukraine. Like they've been fighting over this land for five hundred years, you know, a thousand years. These people like they don't know how to fight a land war in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Maron. So like this is like, but let them think in their arrogance that they understand everything, and then just let them keep playing their arrogance out. Until they sit there and they realize, fuck them at our moves. Yep. The game's over. And that's what's happening right now in Ukraine. And everybody's beginning to get beginning to realize that the only ones who won't give up on this, all roads lead to London, is they're desperately hoping that they can draw the whole thing out and get their war, you know, against to destroy the Russians in 2025 or 2026 if they win the White House, which is why every GOP candidate is some you know, some version of John McCain, just, you know, either the, you know, either the Nikki Haley version or, or whomever, like they're all the same in that respect. So what I would say is long story short, TLDR, you run this operation for as long as you can and you keep inflation low through most of the campaign, but it also allows Powell to keep credit, keep interest rates as high as possible until, unless there's a credit crisis somewhere. Which will probably show up, and then I got, now I got to move to Europe and Japan to figure out how this is all going to play out. But the, the reality is, is that from Putin and Putin's charm tour was to tell them we can weather this, let them do their thing, depeg your currencies, or get prepared for it. The Chinese have got your back. We've got your back. We've got the infrastructure in place. We've got swap lines in place. We've got the Asian development, or the Asian development, or the Asian infrastructure investment bank. We've got the BRICS bank. We've got ways of ensuring that if you run into trouble, we'll get we'll get out from underneath. And the only reason, in my mind, that they're even having to do any of this is because somewhere on someone's balance sheet, there's an awful lot of U.S. dollar denominated debt carried by somebody important within Saudi Arabia and the UAE, either Saudi Aramco. Like you know, analogous to Gazprom and Rosneft in 2014, or you know, just someone's some Saudi prince or some you know Emirati emirate has Emir has like a crap ton of U.S. dollar denominated debt that they have to that has to be either rolled over or hedged because if if what I'm saying is correct, then you can expect the Saudis to get sanctioned by the United States oh. and cut out of the American banking system. Wow. Or someone's, or if it's a person who owe, owes somebody billions of dollars, that they get arrested or nuts and sluts or whatever the the, the the you know what I mean, their assets frozen or however this works. It could be a person, Magnitsky Act style sanctions, could be a country, could be anything, but someone's going to do something. Something Tom, is about to. Tom, do we know how much uh, how much money uh, the Saudis have at the Federal Reserve Bank? No, but I I don't know. It's a lot, probably last a lot. Month, it was between seven hundred and eight hundred billion dollars. That much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's a couple of years ago, and, and I don't know. It could, it might have increased since then. I mean, you know, they sold sold a lot of They're oil. They're selling a whole lot of oil at a whole lot at a, at a whole lot of you know at a, at a whole lot of profit. It's a good question, Alex. I didn't know that the number was that big. Um, no, no, a very very significant number. And I thought that their whole their whole really really weird project of that of that city, you know, like yeah, that yeah, I, I I thought that looks so stupid. They must be trying to get their money out of the Federal Reserve Bank under some global, you know, great reset build back. Oh yeah, that's a, a pretext. They say like, hey, we're doing all this. We're gonna need all these hundreds of billions of dollars, and then launder it through some stupid project just to get it out of as much of it out yeah, from. The, the Fed. The, yeah, the, uh, the the stupid project that looks like the Great Reset itself, like the yeah. the thing that Klaus Schwab and Yuval Harari got, like you know do the unmentionable line. stuff it's that that line. that oh, that only a CNN producer could get caught on a Zoom call doing. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> That's the closest thing I can come to being like, you know, politic. Guys. It's, it's built back a hell of a lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. Then how is this going to play out in Europe? Actually, no, actually, no, before that, right, one of the things that I'm curious about is how does the Israel-Gaza conflict fit into the larger global macro picture? Because I can see with Ukraine and Russia what the intention there was to destroy Russia. But with Israel-Gaza, like how does that... I think the intent out? was to destroy Iran, Rich. I think the intent was to destroy was. Iran. Was. And what, yeah, was. And I think that it's not going to work. Well, you know, what did we see a couple of days ago that they were sending a... They were sending a, a carrier strike group into the Persian Gulf, you know, a magnet for a false flag Gulf of Tonkin something. Mm -hmm. But then since then, uh, the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians, I think, announced uh, uh, naval, naval exercises, which I think is maybe a way to try to counteract that, to preempt. To preempt, I don't know how. You know, I, I don't know how you would do that. But you know, you're not just going to let, you know, a sitting duck of a U.S. carrier strike group sit there in the Persian Gulf waiting for, you know, yeah, something to blow up and to say like, ah, it's the Iranians. Let's start World War Three. So I think that for the moment, nothing happens. I think that the conflict in Israel is going to have to die down because it's not going anywhere. It's just, they already it's, gave it a deadline, Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, I think yeah. it was yesterday or today. They the Americans told Bibi that he needs to finish off by uh, I think the end of January or something like that. He's got a month Probably. or so. Yeah, they gave Probably. him a deadline. They told Bibi him. is very good at listening to the Americans. Mm, yeah, that that's <laughs> their the other problem. Hand, yeah, they do have they do have leverage. They can they can uh, make his life uh, difficult if he if he disobeys. And but I'm sure you know, they've got uh, the runner-up waiting in case. Do, uh, uh, who is it? Who is it, Efrat? It's hard to tell. I, I have my uh, guesses, but um, I would guess it would be someone from the left wing, um, a, a, like a former general, like, for example, Benny Gantz, or for example, mm -hmm. um, someone that is not currently in the in the roster of, of um, members of parliament, but will be put inside like a, a former general or something, someone, someone with an army background. That's my guess, but it would be a left wing one. Um, I hear that Juan Guaido is available. Who? Juan Guaido. <laughs> yeah, he's available. Um, soon Zelensky is going to be available. Who's going to want as well? It didn't work out. So now he's a, uh, he needs a job. Got it. <laughs> He's got, got it. Alex is in Fuego today. Even I know that's not, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure Israel wants to end up like Venezuela and, you know, Gaza. And I'm, I mean, I'm seeing how we're ending up as the next Ukraine, but that's what they wanted. But I don't think mm, it's going to happen, yeah. just like Alex is saying. I think they had an intention to take a, take us to a big war with Iran. And it looks like no one wants to play with the U.S., like I don't US, think the U.S. wants. I don't think the U.S. military wants any of this. I think this is the part that everybody's missing: mm. is that the U.S. is not a monolith. Mm. Okay, I I've described three different right. factions within Europe. There's five factions vying for power in the U.S. at this point. Wow. Mm. Or two of them are actually, um, you know, are actually American patriots, for lack of a better term. Okay, most of them are not. And the, when I see the Biden administration, which I've always mapped to Obama, which then maps me back to Davos, COP26, the, the all those people, I say to myself, oh, look, um, BB went off half cocked on, on Gaza and Biden got the call, he's a mushroom anyway, say, no, stop it. And then we're going to get rid of BB after he's made Israel unacceptable. Here's the thing. I, I, it's hard for you guys to understand because none of you are American. And I, I don't mean that as a pejorative. <laughs> Right. I, I'm immensely. But the internal weirdness of American politics is really important. Um, I, 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 or actually, it's not even that. It's, I don't want to be condescending. American politics are, is really murky. Like, I, I don't, I wouldn't presume to speak for Israeli politics any more than I would speak for, you know, I try to speak about British politics and I usually get out over my skis. Um, 
But American politics, especially this year, with the importance of the 2024 presidential election, is very yeah. – the, the, it's, the, it's everything right now. So let me put a, a scenario in front of you. How do you get Gavin Newsom into the White House? How? That, okay. That's a nightmare. Well, yeah. you've <laughs> got to start – you got to start by looking at the what's going on in the American electorate. Mm -hmm. The center of the country regrets voting for Joe Biden. Yeah. They become hardened anti-war, they're becoming mm -hmm. hardened anti-interventionists. They just they're they're tired of the inflation, they're going broke, they're everything everything bad is happening to them. They see mm -hmm. their congress refuses to legislate and when they do legislate the money seems to go overseas and none of it is spent here. So you've got the emergence of what I would call a radical center coming in the United States, which basically says, fuck the world, America. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't mean Trump per se, but Trump is the candidate that best represents that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the coin, how do you invalidate the rest of the GOP in order to ensure that they're unacceptable so that Gavin Newsom looks like a viable option? Oh, by everybody you lying. Buy, by, by having the GOP come out in favor of genocide of Palestinians for a fucking BB-led bloodbath. Who in the hell, what soccer mom in, Ga in Gainesville, Florida, or Jacksonville, or Wichita, or wherever, is going to vote for freaking all these people who came out and said, yeah, Ben Shapiro was right, we should just, we should just you know, kill them all like God sorted out. They duped the. They literally turned everybody who was thinking about voting Republican to get rid of these un, ungodly, horrible Bidenistas, who they, who clearly at this point everybody looks at and goes, these fucking people are just traitors. But how do you get them to not abreact and vote for the other party? Well, you got to turn. You got to then make everybody go. I'm supporting these genocidal fuckwits. Oh no. I didn't sign up for that either. I got pedos on one side. I got genocidal fuckwits on the other. Who do I vote? Who do I run with? Who do I vote for? Well, that's interesting. And then what happens is you get rid of Biden and you put Newsom in this place. Newsom runs on getting the United States out of Syria. Okay. Backing off in Ukraine. Making, making a deal with China over making a deal with China over Taiwan, which was never, ever, ever going to be invaded. It's all false. That's all a false narrative, too. Mm -hmm. And the big one that just popped into my head the other day, thinking about this, are the tariffs. How do you make Trump? You have to hang Trump if he's going to be the nominee. If they can't put him in jail, your fallback plan. I got hit Nikki Haley, who's, an ins who's insane. Is, you know, John McCain with, you know, you know, the Waffle House waitress version, or you got Donald Trump, who's the architect of stealing the Syrian oil and leaving our troops there. It doesn't matter that John Bolton and everybody else betrayed him. Trump is not, Trump's one weakness is that he never backs down on anything that he put in place. He still backs the vaccines. He'll, he'll, he'll go, if he has to, I can just see Donald Trump in this first debate with Gavin Grusom, and Grusom brings up Syria. And Trump, like, justifying it. And then the tariffs on China, which are the stumbling block. When Xi was in San Francisco, what's the one thing they didn't talk about in the news? The one issue between the United States and China. The big 800-pound gorilla in the room. The Trump tariffs. When they're not talking about it, that's all they talked about. I could, this is the way it's playing out for me. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really fucking do. But, man, oh man, like, how do you get Gavin Newsom in the White House? Well, and that's if you get Gavin Newsom in the White House, you get Nikki Haley, and it's just as bad. As I said, we said at the top of the show, what do they always well, give us? A Hobson's choice between two unacceptable people. Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley sounds positively, certifiably insane. She is. But it's in the water in South Carolina, by the way. No the offense to South Carolina. Are lining, not lining up behind her. They're, okay, she's... they're lining up behind her. Okay, so the so the let's bring up Jamie Dimon. I was chatting with a friend of mine yesterday about this. And let's talk about Wall Street. Wall Street generally gives to both sides, but they generally in New York go 65-35 Democrat versus Republican. And they generally all vote Democrat. The big ones. The Solomons, the Diamonds, whatnot. 
than generally in the Democratic Party. For even for 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 Diamond, to, I, I didn't even catch this. Again, this took me a couple of weeks to process. Until a friend of mine finally just said it to me yesterday. Like, look, Diamond came across, and the best he could do is he crossed the divide, the unbridgeable divide of no nope, Wall Street. It's not going to back the Democratic Party this time. You guys, it's okay to not give money to the Democrats. As a matter of fact, don't give money to the Democrats because then they won't have the money to have a top of ticket, run all the down the money for the down ballot races and all the rest of it. Even and at this point, Nikki Haley is the one that they can best control. Even though well, she's crazy. Wouldn't wouldn't you wouldn't you put forward Nikki Haley because you want uh, uh, Gavin Newsom in the White House? Maybe. But yeah, she's so also like, a fall. I think I think Diamond is resolved that Trump is going to be the, 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 the nominee on the, le- uh, on the right, and they can't stop him. I honestly think that within about two months, we're going to figure out that they can't stop Trump unless they put him in jail or shoot him. Well, there's that conversation growing in the mainstream media in the West. But they won't, they won't, kill, they won't shoot Trump until after the election. They'll shoot him between November and the inauguration, and they'll try and saddle him with somebody horrible. So Haley, running for VP. Vivek Ramaswamy, running for VP. And the best thing Trump can do is go completely off the board. And his best choice at that point would be anybody, anybody else. And I could, I mean, I, the three of you would be a better choice. I think I was thinking you, Tom. No, I, yeah, no, I, you don't want me as you don't want me as president. <laughs> no, VP. Told, I, you used to watch my old live streams, Rich. You know exactly <laughs> what I would do. I got. We're out of Afghanistan it. now, so I would have to update my. Okay, Vlad, who who are the who are your spetsnaz going to kill now? As I live stream it at the inauguration. No, like you don't want you don't want my you don't want my Roger Waters version of of, of reality, folks. It 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 looks bad. I like oh, an eye for two eyes and a little bit of scary. Li- libertarian justice theory is not good as, you as and, president. No, you I'm, and Trump, you and Trump in the White House, that'd be so entertaining. Oh, it would be hilarious. Are you kidding? But no, um, I, I'm not doing it. I'm I, I, okay. no. I did remand my ass to Guantanamo before that ever happened. Okay. I'd have, I'd, have a, I'd, have a, I'd have a date with being waterboarded like 18 ways from Sunday. But, you know, it's a living. Right. Okay. Alex, anything you want to say, add or take it? Anyone yeah, I want to say that Efron was waiting to say something. I just wanted to ask a silly question. Do you really believe all this politics bullshit of right and left and Republicans and Democrats? I mean, this is all very serious, but in the end of the day, are they not just puppets as well? They are. They are, right? But the, but, but the, the GOP and the DNC are. But they're, but these are the vessels by which anybody is. is the, the bigger question is who's now behind them? Yes. And manipulating things. Yes. I think I think there are some very, very powerful people in the United States right now working very hard to get control of things. I think that we have reached kind of peak clown world. Mm-hmm. And now we're trying to go, okay, this is as far as we're willing to go. Like everybody's looked so. into the abyss and went, oh, we're going to do that? No, 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 we're not doing that. And then you've got to then figure out how to get there. And because this is a big battleship, it has to be turned around in a very small space. And there are yeah. so many competing factions and there's so many, there's this, I mean, Rich, you know how, what, you know how hard it's been just Brexit. Like how badly the civil service has undermined Brexit and how, you know, and like all of the competing factions and, and, and these people, like, you know. Like you thought it was going to end when they finally got rid of Mark Sedwell. Well, guess what? It got worse after he got they got rid of Sedwell. We thought he was the devil. Like, and it's ten times worse now than it ever was yeah. because they never stop because these people get infinite at bats, yeah. and the only way to stop really stop the to get this whole engine of corruption to stop is to make the dollar so goddamn expensive that it kills everybody's leverage and you wipe them all out. And that's why. I mean, look, the way the bond markets are traded over the last. Three weeks. Mm. If I were federal Federal Reserve Chair, I would raise fifty basis points next week and put everybody on notice that I'm deadly fucking serious. Banks go raise capital. Commercial real estate guys take the fucking losses. We are done with this bullshit. America is for Americans. We're done with all that. The when because look, guys. There are new rules coming down the pike as far as how treasuries get repoed and and all that stuff. It's all starting. There's a new market for U.S. treasuries, and it's all and it's all going to have to go through clearing houses, and those clearing houses are going to require 100% collateral. And when that happens, all the rehypothecated bullshit that's been going on for years within the repo markets stops dead cold, just like Basel III and the gold 
um, coverage, right? Alex, I know you know about this stuff, right? The 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 um, the net funding ratio for gold that you know gold will be a tier one capital asset, and you know it's going to have to be backed by physical, and it can't be backed by any rehypothecated assets. The same thing is coming for the Treasury Department for U.S. Treasuries in repo transactions in the United States. So all those dollars that are being de-dollarized overseas are going to have a domestic sink, heat sink, to be dumped into to collateralize the new repo markets in the United States. And that is what Powell is trying to get us over the line towards. Implementing okay. SOFR was the first part, and now that, and now all of a sudden, you know, that there's a, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a different world than we've, mm-hmm. than we've all lived through our entire lives. And because of that, these titanic changes, the political stuff is the, 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 the political air of desperation that we all can see and feel. I mean, we're all talking about it. Mm-hmm. It's coming because these people can see this stuff coming a mile away and they're trying to wriggle out of the Chinese finger traps that have been laid for them. Mm-hmm. Putin's done it with his relations in Saudi Arabia, but you know, we've seen it in, in all these different areas, and they're all coming. And if I'm wrong, well, I'm, I am epically wrong. Okay. Okay. Tom, I got to say, um, before I go into my next question, is this has been a fabulous education for all of us. Really, really great. Thank you so much. I, you know, this is the, I haven't done a lot of interviews recently, Rich. So like this, this stuff's been like laying, this stuff's been like laying out here over my head for like two weeks now. And I'm like, how much do I talk about? Cause I got to write an issue in a week. And like, oh, shit. So, you saved right, it but I'm sorry guys. I didn't, I don't no, mean, no, I hate no. to hog the microphone, but unfortunately. No, 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 not at all. Efra and I are both good. learning. I think this is, I mean, this is the first time you and Efra have had a conversation. And then Alex, Alex is coming in with some very pithy, profound, uh, contributions every now and then that keeps it all rolling. Thank you so much, Alex. No, it's just really, really oh, great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Europe and the euro. So the Saudi DPEG, oil price being crashed down. Well, that's going to be good for Europe. It's going to be good for Davos and in Europe and the EU. But the DPEG of the dollar, that's going to be chaotic for Europe, I think, from, you know, I don't have the sort of insight that or the training or experience that you tom have or you have alex how's it going to play out for europe rich i i don't know europe is such a cesspool oh sorry and there's all these elections happening as well in europe it's it's that it's i don't even get it it's like spain is slip sliding into a civil war um, Germany is turning into like a totally totalitarian nightmare. Um, Italy is falling apart. We're being overrun by migrants. Um, I- Ireland as well. I do a fair amount of coverage on Ireland. I- Ireland is turning into a totalitarian dystopia as well. Um, ECB is. No, sorry, not the ECB. Uh, European Commission has lost all legitimacy. It doesn't seem to me that anybody cares anymore. You know, we're we're all supposed to be unquestionably, unquestioningly implementing East European Commission directives. Um, nobody cares. You know, the Polish farmers are blocking the 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 the, the, the border with Ukraine. Um, I. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but it seems to me that we're going in a direction of a really, really ugly collapse, which I don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah, you know, oil price is going to go down, then it's going to go up again. Uh, they're printing the euros like there's, like, like there's no tomorrow. Uh, they're raising interest rates also, which which I don't know what they're thinking, but, you know, we're already on the And raising rates at the same time, Alex. They're doing yield curve control and raising rates at the same time. It's a, and, it's an and absolute, preparing it's an everyone absolute nightmare. for the the digital euro that yeah, also I, happened I, yeah, a month yeah. ago. Yeah, 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 but I I don't even think that's going to work out either. Yeah, me neither. No, they're I, just trying to normalize it. In the, yeah, and you know they're not giving. You know they're saying like, are oh, you going to have a choice between, you know, digital euro and the normal cash? Yeah. Yeah. They're not doing this because they're being kind of democratic and giving people the choice. They're doing it because they have absolutely no confidence that the whole thing is going to work at all. Yeah. And I have full confidence that it isn't. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I mean, Agreed. could you put more incompetent people 
in charge of like probably the most complex project that's ever been contemplated ever in history of, of the universe. It's, you know, we're tyranny of midwits, right? The convocation of midwits running around, um, you know, running around. And this is the problem with midwits is that they think they're smart. Yeah. Well, I don't think these people even think that they're smart. How could you? Well, I mean, you know, they, well, they've been given, they've been given enough, like they've been given enough participation trophies over the years. They um, do and think they've been given smart. enough, and they've been given enough of, uh, you know, I mean, look at Ursula von der Leyen. Every time she fails, she gets a, she gets a promotion. So why don't you just keep failing? Mm. I mean, where do you go from there? Like, you know, I mean, it, it, yeah, they're but, put you know, in place well, because they, they're put in place because they're good this, soldiers. Yeah, the system of failing upwards. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are who are subordinated to you in, in this hierarchy know exactly the kind of wanker that you are when you when you're supposed to lead them. And so when you when you when you sorry we lost Tom. No, no, wanker. <laughs> That's hilarious, dude. Right. Just, wanker was the last word I was expecting to come out of your mouth. Like, you know, I, I love it hilarious. because he speaks so seriously, and then he says a word like wanker in such calmness. <laughs> Even though your mom is watching, Empty. Alex, I'm, I'm so I am. Yeah, yeah, I'm so I, I love Alex's delivery. It's just fine. It's just fantastic. I, no, but I, you know, I the the reason is that I'm 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 really I'm profoundly frustrated mm -hmm. about the fact that we're being led by. People mm -hmm. that you wouldn't elect even to 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 run like a like a community football club. Yeah, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't you know in Croatia no, we said like you wouldn't you wouldn't let them uh, keep three um, paper paper cut sheep. You know, <laughs> we um, and, I, these are the same people that you that you looked at running for student government going. Yeah. Okay. You want that job? You can have it. Yeah. But you yeah. wouldn't vote for the men. Like it's the same thing. And the, the, but, they, you know the they're, problem. They're in power because they were placed there. They were given orders. They're very good order takers, and they're very good implementers of 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 what it is that they've been they've been told to do. And they don't know, they don't know how to improvise. None yeah, of these wait, people are jazz. They don't have any talent. They don't have any conviction, and it's their only way they're going to have any power by bending to the will of those that bribe them and control them. Well, yeah, but you know, like that. What kind of power is that when everybody you have to rely on to to implement these measures knows that you're a loser, that you're incompetent, and that you have no idea. You know, like everything you ever touched in your life turned into into excrement, into dung, and now you're telling people, "Well, do this and do that," and we're we're. I don't know. You know, like it's it's. Uh, it's like John Kerry announcing, you know, grandiose announcement that the United States is going to go off of coal, that they're going to decommission all the all the coal power plants by what what was it, twenty thirty five? It's like well, good luck with that. Country. Good luck with that. What what is wrong I mean, with these people? Well, because because Alex, again, I mean, I just wanted to say, like, when you only have one script, then you just stick to it. These people are your typical. Customer service, first level customer service people. They have a script, they stick to it. They're just like Giannis Varoufakis said during the Greek debt crisis. You go in there, you've got all these ideas, you present your all, you work your you work your ass off for weeks trying to craft a, a solution that everybody can live with, and we're gonna get this is, it's all gonna work, and we've got a plan, and we're we want to pay you back, and we want to do the right thing, and blah 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 blah. And then you make your presentation, and they look at you like you just sung the Swedish national anthem, and then they go, so um, we're gonna like fuck Greece and take the Parthenon, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. And yeah. then we move on. Like but, that's that. But you this see, this is the, the world, the, and this is the world that I, they live in. And you know, and the reason that they're that they're so they're so caught up in this is because no one has ever finally just said to them, "Okay, it's time for you to go to the home." They don't believe that they don't have any power. Again, cope twenty eight, not cop twenty eight. Yeah. But but you see the uh, I, I see I see great danger in this because I don't understand what happens if if all the if if all the power structures fail if they can no longer command you know like w what happens if law and order breaks down and well, we're they, I'm on together. both gold and guillotines Alex you know that yeah more authoritarianism more resistance sure like what's happening in Ireland? and then they'll, and then they'll tell us and then they'll and and they'll gaslight us by telling us that Donald Trump will be the will be the authoritarian oh my god have you listened to have you listened to the to the uh, the, the, the histrionics coming out of the american uh, media about trump 
they're all on point. If he gets elected, he'll be a dictator. He'll it, it'll oh, yeah. be bad for oh, yeah. it, the people are going to go to jail. Like no, you're going to go to jail. It'll be bad <laughs> for you. It won't be bad for me. It won't be bad for my wife. It won't be bad for you know my gaming buddies down in Gainesville. It won't be bad for the for for the guy who who, who works the the. Your jockeys to register over at the gas station. It'll be bad for you, Joe Scarborough. It'll be bad for you. Lindsey Graham, this one, that one, whoever it is, Joy Behar, and all the rest of them. They're the ones that will be that who will be destroyed. They know that they are guilty of crimes against humanity. The only thing they can do now is double down and hope they win. Because what's their option? To admit that they were wrong? To admit that they did what they did, then they can then they go to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect your two hundred billion dollars, right? So you have to just keep fronting and hoping, because you're they're like liars who have been caught in the lie. So you just keep lying. Narcissists okay. don't back down; they double down. Okay, now bringing it to the European politicians and the European leaders, and what you said earlier, Tom, about the how the Gaza Israel conflict serve to make the GOP unpalatable to the center. How do you see, and this could be any one of you, that playing out with the European body politic? Because I, I, I saw a little video um, of Keir Starmer. He was in arriving in Glasgow. Oh, my God. The the reception that he got. It's like, it's like Trudeau. Trudeau gets everywhere. Wherever he goes in Canada, this was now happening to Starmer. And it's it's fractured the Labour Party. But the the Tories aren't that different, really. So how the is Tories that? Have been destroyed. The Tories are, are just they're just controlled opposition. The same thing with the GOP in the United States is. I mean, I but think we have the, other know, European nations. What's that? What, what, but what about for the European Union and uh, the German government and? The, I think you have a bigger problem in that. I, I saw I, I watched I, I saw something the other day. Ed, the big news coming out, Poland. Poland's been buying gold like it's hand like it's going out of style. Yeah, and the the dumb take, the low information, the low quality take is that oh well, the poles are buying gold in order to you know get to the uh, to to the the level necessary to to make the you know the European Union's um, uh, transition to a gold standard. Occur. I'm like, I, I, this, this, the guy from Gainesville Coins came up with this one. This, 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 this howler the other day. I'm like, that is not why the Poles are buying gold. If you look at the European countries, the Eastern European countries were all buying, been buying, or traditionally buy gold. Hungary bought gold recently. Poland's buying a lot. Serbia buys a lot every day. Blah, blah, blah. It's, it's the countries that all still have their own currencies. So ones that aren't on the euro. The euro collapse is coming. The Poles are getting ready to leave. The Polish Central Bank is mm-hmm. getting ready to, to is, is getting ready for political chaos in Poland and the breakup of the European Union. Mm. Where we have after this election, we still don't have a government. Yeah. Donald Tusk didn't Donald Tusk and the anti and, and the Davos coalition didn't get enough. So law and justice didn't get enough. We've got a we've got a fractured and and the people are saying we don't want either of you people. We want Poland for Poland, and we're done with all of this. And you know, look, the same thing happened in Turkey. Poland is in the same position that Turkey was in after um, we blew apart Syria. Poland was promised Lvov, Lviv, Lvov, whatever, tomato, tomato, right? The that that portion of Ukraine when they won, when NATO won, that was their gift, just like Erdogan was. Promised Idlib and a whole bunch of you now and, and and all of that, but they had to take in a whole bunch of refugees from the war, right? Erdogan took in three million refugees. Some he used them as blackmail and and leverage to get concessions out of the European Union. They strung him along. They never gave him. They never. He never. Turkey never joined the EU. Well, guess what? Poland's the same problem because they're already in the EU, and they didn't get their gibs, and the British have left them out to hang, and and and. and. And it's clearly they're not if they're going to get their Gibbs, it's gonna come from Putin, not from the EU. Yeah. And so now there's a lot of soul searching going on, I think, within the Polish political, you know, soup, for lack of a better term. It's like, what are they gonna do? 
and someone is going to finally, and it's the same thing that happened in the Netherlands. Like Geert Wilde was winning, right? And then we're going to have, like, we've got state elections in Germany coming. What I, I a patron pinged this to me, a German patron pinged this to me this morning. He said, oh, by the way, tomorrow is the two-year anniversary of the formation of the current uh, traffic light coalition in Germany. Guess what happens at that point? All the ministers get their pensions. So if you want to know why Christian Lidner, the the head of the FDP, hasn't pulled out of the coalition out of the coalition yet, is because he's waiting to get his friggin' pension guaranteed. So it opens up the window that we could have a collapse of the. I mean, it's just a, I don't know if it's like I don't know if it's bullshit or it's not bullshit, but it's like it's just it could come, literally come down to the individuals at the tops of these parties just waiting to get their thing, and then oh yeah, no, we're out of here. Yeah, because they can see the and then because all you're waiting for is the next state election in Germany to go way against the current government, and they and then no bribe from Davos is big enough, especially if there are bribes coming from somewhere else, i.e., from Wall Street. Okay. Then the question is, who's got, you know, whose balance sheet reigns supreme to for the bribes? Yep. Okay, Efrat. Alex. Yeah, I want I want to say something um, not related to this question because I have no idea what will happen in Europe. And Alex uh, said it right, but I, I do want to add to something you said, Alex, about the the right people just taking orders. And um, one thing that I saw today, the journalist in Israel called Carolyn Glick, she exposed that there's a um, this is this has been ongoing. It's not new, but I think most people don't know this. Not in Israel and not overseas. But retired um, major generals from the army in Israel, when they retire, they retire normally quite young, like uh, forty-five to fifty, let's say, and um, they're used to receiving very high paychecks and a lot of uh, you know driver, a personal driver, and like good conditions and all of a sudden they're unemployed um and normally what happens there's like this route that is uh, designed for them to go and work uh, in the US for some research institutes and one of them could be the Martin Indic uh research institute the same Martin Indic that worked for um Bill Clinton and was receiving and that that specific research institute was receiving funding from Qatar and these people then go back to Israel and uh, in a way, I would call this the deep state, right? They they would navigate Israel's, try to navigate Israel's policies uh, under the um, liking of Martin Indic Research Institute or the U.S. new boss that they have. Um, and they're like former major generals, like they're highly respected people in Israel. And they would be funded by this foreign arm, and they would, in a way, try to circumvent things in Israel uh, to go a certain direction. And we're talking about thousands of people that are in this group of retired uh, major generals. I mean, so I saw that um, that um, video interview of hers, the, the journalist in Israel, talking about that and the fact that Qatar has funded this research institute and that is to me that is so interesting because you're talking about people who follow or orders these are the best people that follow orders and once they finish their army service they in a way look for a new boss to keep their high uh, standard of living so they could continue you know getting those high wages and 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 their the the comfortable life that they're used to um but this time it's not the israeli army anymore or the um or or they may not have the best interest of the Israeli um, people at mind. Now they have a new boss overseas. So it's like... Same boss that supports Hamas. That's, Hamas. that's amazing insight, Efren. That's this, this Qatar that you've been mentioning. Is that, is that that same Qatar that's been giving hundreds of millions of dollars to Hamas? And is that, that the Qatar? same Qatar? Is that the same Qatar that today I saw? And I I still need to check it out and verify all this information. But I saw today another article from a French uh, magazine talking about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu receiving funding from Qatar to sponsor the Likud party, his party, his right wing party. I 
didn't know this and I'm not sure whether this is correct or not. It needs to be validated. But And the article is from the end of 2021. It's not new. So I need to go dig a little bit. But the Qatarians definitely have a very interesting role um, yeah. in this game. Yes, from all and, sides. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because, you know, also Qatar has uniquely for Middle Eastern countries, has a very they have a very deep uh, relationship with the British government and the British defense establishment. Yeah. They share two air force bases in mm -hmm. England mm. where Qatari pilots and uh, British pilots train together on their on their uh, typhoons or whatever jets they they are buying from from Great Britain. And then you know today, if you support Hamas, they haul your ass to prison, right? In Europe, in, in, in Germany, in, in France. But Qatar, which has given hundreds of millions of dollars, I don't know, like $300 million a year, $400 million a year to Hamas, um, they just got, la uh, what, uh, a month ago, did they got a $9 billion loan from UBS or Credit Suisse, whatever it was. That's really funny how that works, isn't it? And, like and isn't it also funny that one of the major players in the negotiations of returning the hostages, the kidnapped hostages, the Israeli ones from Gaza, were the Qatarians? They were the ones now uh, a major player in the in these negotiations. Like we go to them and ask for their help. They're not the only ones, but they're they're definitely one of the major ones helping bringing back the Israeli hostages. Um, Okay, Tom. That's it. Thank you, Efra. Thank you, Alex. Tom. You, you, you may. This you is this, this is the, this is the part of the program where I sit back and listen because I don't. <laughs> but I'm. The, this is no. Keep going. Okay. Um, carry on. Okay. Well, look. I'm gonna. I'm no, gonna... But, you know, I th I think that what, what what is obvious here is that we have some kind of a, a very Train. far out deep state uh, agenda playing out. Where you know they're using Qatar because what is Qatar? It's nothing, right? They're using them as the hub yeah. for uh, for these clandestine uh, terrorist activities. They're funding both sides, huh? You know, divide and rule. Like let 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 you and him fight. You know, that's the the, the same old deal. You're you're funding both sides. You have people inside. Both structures that can they can they can pull the levers and press the switches, and uh, it it kind of reminds me a lot of uh, you know the, the 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 way the way they used Baku back in the early nineties uh, when you know when they when they ran the whole you know jihadi network where Bin Laden was no it was it was Richard Secord it was it was General Richard Secord who set up um, a, a CIA front oil company in Baku in Azerbaijan, right? And then he also set up an airline which secretly uh, flew jihadis that uh, Osama bin Laden um, recruited and trained in, in Afghanistan to then, you know, start these terror organizations that attacked Russia in Chechnya and in Dagestan. It hmm. sounds like, it sounds like a, a very similar playbook, except you know, it's not Baku this time. It's a, uh, it's 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 Qatar. Qatar, Qatar right. in Arabic. Sorry, it's Qatar in Arabic because I worked there for four years. I worked in Qatar. Believe it or oh, not. Oh yeah, yeah. But anyway, anyway, I'm going to finish this up, right? Because um, it's time. It's we've, and I just really, really appreciate each and every single one of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any last, quick last words from any of you? I plan to, I'm, I'm not suicidal. I plan to live on many years. I'm not ready to give out any last words. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I know I haven't been around, you know, done a lot of media recently. And it's not because I don't have, it's not because I have information leading to the arrest of Hillary Clinton. So, if, uh, you know. <laughs> Is that anything for you, Efra? Uh, no, I mean, it's really good to be back on the interview set because I um I was refusing a lot of interviews in the last month because of the situation and and in light of the 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 new regulations that have been put in place in Israel to 
lower national morale and you know be be ju- be be criminalized with incitement for talking against uh, the country or whatever so I've been very careful and um a lot of people have been arrested in Israel uh, and there there are some really strict uh, regulations in place now in light of the war I've been reporting on it on my substack so if you want to see what kind of new rules we have in place you can check it out um I made like a list of seven and I'll give another update soon about stuff that is happening around Israel uh, but just one thing if I can mention uh, that that is happening and to me most people don't talk about it but I pay attention so and and this is tr- quite strange for me just in light of uh, the recent visit from Elon Musk to Israel um and The Gaza envelope area, the same area that has been infiltrated and uh, attacked on October 7th, uh, has been announced to become a green energy island, right? They're going to rebuild it back better uh, oh. now. Yeah, greener. And uh, they have a program um, to support renewable energies um, to meet the climate goals of 2030, which Israel is failing in. And... Um, They basically said that alongside you know energy production, green energy production, water systems, and all this crap, they're like renewable. They're also going to make sure that this area has a solar field and uh, infrastructure for charging electric vehicles. This is surprise, surprise. Yeah, Musk yeah no, they, just they, visited just, just, just to um, remind everybody that um, um, climate change is cope for middle class Americans for feeling bad about their colonial. Um, past it's really not that hard and you know um, that's all it is when the truth of the matter is is that it's just um, you know look to who doesn't produce hydrocarbons and then understand who's pushing this right and so um, you know it's the same thing that Alex and I've talked about forever um, 2024 is going to be the year of collateral collateral is going to be the work you know, Alex and I've been talking about it together for a couple of years now and Um, it's going to be the and oil is the collateral for everything ultimately because without oil and you know there is no economy there is none of this stuff one of the things I want you to put in your head in all my crap spilling about you know bombing the price of oil and taking out the Saudis and blah 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 is that you watch who's buying mm. the energy stocks that get beaten down during the next beat down. Mm. And you'll have your answers to what's going on. Mm. I can tell you flat out that if I were I were all of these climate things, uh, the one thing I would be buying is Shell, Exxon, Chevron, this one, that one, because of course, I'm getting the distinct bid prices. Yep, not hard. Mm-hmm, okay. mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. All right, folks, it was fun. Um, Efrat, it was good. very good to meet you. And, uh, you too, Tom. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. I, this Thank is you. what I do. I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure if any of it's right. I just, I just <laughs> throw shit at the wall and then we see Tom, what happens. Tom, you have a great track record. The way I do, but I, but I could also, but I, but I also, I miss a lot. But you have, but in order to hit, you got to be willing to, to miss. Yeah. Right. And so. Well, I guess you have to do stuff. another I'm one just on not, gold not and Bitcoin, because I'm curious to hear What's from that? you about that. Go get him started. Bitcoin. Get but that's, that's a whole Bear other. Bear assets. That's <laughs> next time. Bear assets. The, 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 the year of collateral. Bitcoin's collateral. So is gold. So is oil. So, uh, right. If you can hold on for a few minutes afterwards, I want a quick word with you. Alex, Tom, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. This will go out uh, recorded, like I said. I'll have the links to Tom's, tomlawonga.me, Alex Cray, Crainer, Naked Hedgie, and Trent Compass, and Efrat Substack, and her Twitter. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, between now and when I see you next, please keep remembering that The Great Reset will fail. and fill your pockets with peace and freedom. Crypto Rich, <laughs> Crypto Alex, Crypto Tom, and Crypto Efrat signing out. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rich. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.